good evening and welcome to episode 21 of Fracking Nightmare. So Fracking Nightmare maybe comes of age. Well, when one comes of age, one has to get used to playing by big boys or big girls rules. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about tonight. Big boys rules. Because it seems that the agenda to introduce hydraulic fracturing in the UK is being ramped up. The rules are changing as the British government and the industry realizes that they do not and will not get their social license to continue with this industry. So consequently, they're now going to start riding roughshod. And a, a revelation that has come into the public domain literally in the last day or so is very, very significant. So we're going to be looking at a contribution from um, Mr. Snowden, who of course is probably second only to um, a Mr. Assange in terms of the public enemy of the establishment for releasing information that the the establishment would rather not enter the public domain. But before we get into that, a week ago, I was reporting on the events at Barton Moss, where this young lady, Vanda, as you can see here, being brutally held up against the uh, fence by um, Officer 12933, um, this is actually uh, the same officer that uh, pulled her out of the crowd. As we've now seen from the video, um, she actually didn't do anything at all to be arrested. Uh, she was actually a, at least a pace away from the front line when the officer that is uh, holding her head on the ground there lunged forward and pulled her through the, the back line and then thrust her onto the ground before forcing her head up against the fence there. Now, what happened after that was really quite remarkable because Vanda was taken to the police station at Swinton and then at two o'clock in the morning, the police wanted to release Vanda when in literally a, a onesie, a paper white boiler suit onesie. Now, Vanda wasn't too impressed with the idea of hitting the streets of Swinton at two o'clock in the morning, dressed only in a paper onesie without money and without a phone. So she declined to be released. Well, the following morning, she was taken to court. And in court, there was a whole nother story. Vanda was actually accused of assaulting a police officer. And as you can clearly see from these photographs, Vanda was obviously assaulting this officer's fist with the side of her head. Here she was uh, clearly um, uh, assaulting his, uh, his arm with her throat. And um, here, well, her, she's obviously assaulting him as she uh, puts her hands behind her back to be handcuffed. But in addition, not satisfied with this allegation, she was also apparently, reportedly, accused of lunging at the desk sergeant. Well, this is unbelievable, but not surprising because it's what we have come to expect from the Greater Manchester Police. And to everyone's shock, Vanda was actually remanded in custody for seven days. Now, she was fortunately released a few days early, but uh, Vanda is clearly being targeted by the Greater Manchester Police. And this, fortunately, only serves to strengthen the resolve of the local community who uh, have come out in tremendous support for Vanda and indeed for the Barton Moss Community Protection Camp. And in fact, a vigil was held at the weekend outside the headquarters of Greater Manchester Police, where everyone who attended, let it be known that this kind of behavior just will not be tolerated, but it's not in any way going to intimidate. Well, the tact 
tactics, not just of the Greater Manchester Police, but of the British establishment, are descending to new depths. And last week there was an episode of Casualty, and um, this episode was uh, titled The Lies We Tell. And uh, the write-up said that it was going to include uh, some um, uh, fracking protesters. Well, when, it was, uh, when I saw that the title was The Lies We Tell, I thought it probably was starring Chief Superintendent Mark Roberts of the Greater Manchester Police, because Chief Superintendent Mark Roberts clearly lives in an alternate reality, because he has... Uh, a version of events of Barton Moss, which uh, he still cannot release any of the evidence gatherer's footage to support his claims that the protection community at Barton Moss are primarily there to antagonise the police. And you know what, Chief Superintendent Mark Roberts, the reality is that the more you trot out this absolute BS then the more you simply undermine what's left of the credibility of yourself and the Greater Manchester Police. Well, the episode of Casualty, which, of course, not having a TV, I had to um, wait uh, a while before it was uh, up on iPlayer. But uh, basically, the plot was this, that uh, a group of anti-fracking protesters were being led by the young girl you see here who states that she was fed up with peaceful protest and wanted to get people to sit up and uh, take notice. And as part of her plan, she was going to throw a stinger across the road, which led to a tanker on its way to the uh, alleged frack site actually turning over. Well, her boyfriend... Uh, decides that uh, he didn't want to be part of this and that uh, he wanted to not just run away but rescue the tanker driver. Well, we later discover that the boyfriend is none other than an undercover police officer. And then with um, uh, an actual hint of reality, the uh, boyfriend here actually gets the girl pregnant. Uh, but, of course, she doesn't know that he's an undercover police officer. And, uh, of course, uh, many of you will be aware that uh, this has actually uh, happened, that undercover police officers have indeed um, ingratiated themselves into activist communities and established uh, relationships with members of the opposite sex, got them pregnant, and then, of course, at the appropriate time, just cut and run. Well, to date... There has not been a single violent act, and neither will, will there be, by the anti-fracking protection community. If there is any violence put into this protest, it will be the work of infiltrators, because the absolute commitment of the anti-fracking community is to raise awareness through peaceful protest. The target audience is Middle England, covering the full spectrum of the socio-political, religious, philosophical arena. So everyone who is determined to shut down this abominable agenda in the UK knows full well that the last thing that we need is any kind of violence towards either the police and certainly not the industry. We don't need to. We hold all the moral high ground. All we ask is that people do the research for themselves and come to their own realisation that this is not something that you don't only just not want in your backyard, you don't want in your country. Meanwhile, meanwhile, we know, of course, that the government and the industry is doing everything it can to undermine the efforts of the anti-fracking community. And Edmund Snowden has recently put into the public domain a remarkable document, a remarkable presentation that has been used at GCHQ. 
This is the uh, communications monitoring station based at Cheltenham in Gloucestershire. And uh, an article posted on my good friend Patrick Henningsen's uh, website makes this observation. He said it's not enough that the governments of both the UK and the US are blanket spying on each other's populations and then swapping data, but now we see how they are aggressively targeting individuals in secret, undermining them and eventually setting out to to destroy them, and all the while employing organized deception with the full backing of the state security apparatus to achieve a series of said outcomes. Well, let's just take a look at a few of these uh, slides here. The, this, is, this is from the actual presentation uh, put out or used by GCHQ. So here we see the disruption operational playbook. The infiltration operation, the ruse operation, the set peace operation, the false flag operation, the false rescue operation, the disruption operation, and the sting operation. So in other words, they're looking to ensure that they've got a technique and a tactic for any given scenario. And top of the list here is set up a honey trap. Set up the honey trap. God oh dear, you think they'd get a little bit more creative. I mean, this is straight out of um, Mossad's playbook. Of course, the motto of uh, Mossad is by way of by way of deception. Thou shalt do war. Well, of course, this is warfare. It's chemical warfare on the British people. It's uh, warfare that is intent on destroying the quality of the nation's water supply, the soil, and ultimately the air. So this is a war for a ecology that will support future generations. It says change their photos on social networking sites. Write a blog to be purporting or purporting to be one of their victims. We've seen that a few times. Email and text their colleagues, neighbors and friends, etc. Here we go, discredit a company, leak confidential information to companies, the press via blogs, post negative information on appropriate forums, stop deals and ruin business relationships. And this is your caring, sharing government. And it doesn't matter which party is in office because they are simply the tools of the global corporations anyway. Here we go, the definition. Using online techniques to make something happen in the real or cyber world. Two broad categories, information operations, influence or disruption, and technical disruption. Obviously the crashing of websites or, uh, or wiping of computers. Known in GCHQ as Online Covert Action, OCA. Online Covert Action. Well, it's no longer covert, is it? Well, we knew it wasn't anyway. The four Ds, deny, disrupt, degrade, and deceive. You arrogant mother frackers. This is just incredible, but not surprising. Cyber offensive session, pushing the boundaries and action against hacktivism. Mm. Well, here we go. We start to get on to uh, you know, the charts, which um, you can pause if you're watching this on YouTube, or of course you can actually go on to 21st Century Wire. And, uh, and search for this full presentation and peruse it at your leisure. So here we have the, um, the way in which they link everything here through history, political science, biology, economics, psychology, anthropology, sociology, uh, making a science out of infiltration. Well, here it is, here's the simplified version. Identify and exploiting fracture points. Looking for weaknesses in the organization, looking for fragile individuals and deliberately upsetting those fragile individuals, uh, causing then fractions within the, uh, within the group. Well, now, this is, this is to say that basically, when we are talking to people online who you don't know, one should automatically perhaps assume that one needs to take extra caution. It's a completely different ball game if you know the individual, if you're familiar with them, if you've met with them. Even then, of course, you can't be sure. But over time, over time, use experience to determine whether or not the people you're talking to or the people that you're working with are actually batting for the same team. I, of course, have experienced this firsthand. The moment that I named Bob Kaluza 
as a primary person of interest in the Deepwater Horizon disaster, then I became a focal point. And BP, of course, didn't sully their own hands. They used a third party to then literally demonize me within the, uh, the community that was trying to get justice for the victims of the Deepwater Horizon disaster. When I talk about the victims, I'm not just talking about the 11 people and their families, the 11 people who were killed on the rig, but also the people who were affected by the, in their lives and their, their businesses and their livelihoods as a result of that uh, horrendous disaster. The moment I named Bob Kaluza, then that's when BP came after me. Uh, and if you search for Ian Crane BP, you'll find that there is allegation that a $10 million lawsuit has been initiated against both myself and a US journalist by the name of Deborah Dupre. Our crime, of course, was to draw attention to what actually happened on the rig in the three days leading up to that disaster. I'm pleased to say that Bob Kaluza and his counterpart, Donald Vadreen, were indicted on 11 counts of involuntary manslaughter in uh, late November of 2012. So if one's going to put one's neck on the line, then one has to be ready for the full force of the establishment to be launched against us. You know, this is big boys' rules. The reality is, though, that not everybody either needs to be or has to be, and certainly doesn't want to be, on the front line. But those people who are on the front line in whatever way, shape or form are absolutely reliant on the support that they get from everybody else who shares their ideals. This is not a fair battle by any stretch of the imagination. The government and the corporations have bottomless pockets. They can borrow money, they could print the money, whereas we literally can be fleeced, and surely they will try to fleece us of everything that we think we might have. Let's take a short break. Introducing the magazine for free thinkers. 100 pages of high quality color print. Packed with information the mainstream media will never tell you. Published quarterly covering a range of subjects including politics, history, science and technology. Uncensored magazine. Think for yourself. Back issues also available on CD-ROM in PDF format. To subscribe, visit worldwideweb.uncensoredmag.co.uk or call us on 0207-558-8869. I'm sure that many people found what I shared in part one to be disturbing. This is supposedly a democracy. It's not. It is a corporatist police state masquerading as a democracy. It should be becoming increasingly evident that no one really gives a damn what the elected representative has to say on any real given topic. A classic example of this, of course, is Barbara Keeley, the MP for the uh, Salford and Eccles area, uh, which encompasses Barton Moss, the uh, exploratory drilling site of IGAS. Barbara Keeley has been consistent in her opposition to hydraulic fracturing and to the presence of IGAS within her constituency. But it's a case of thanks very much for telling us what you think, Barbara, but no one really gives a damn because you don't have any authority. We can do what we want to do with complete impunity. But you keep telling the people that you're against it because that looks like there's democracy. It's a charade. It's a total charade. Again, Patrick Henningsen writes that the files released by uh, Edmund Snowden show how shill agents infiltrate the Internet to manipulate, stage and attempt to corrupt reputations. 
Is it okay for the GCHQ to use taxpayers' money and technology that was intended to prevent foreign attacks to discredit UK citizens? Are these extreme tactics of deception by our government honourable? Ha! Honour in politics? Give me a break. These documents show how the uh, GCHQ trains and engages in false flag operations to purposely deceive and set individuals up online. Well, I work on the basis that everything I write, everything I say is going to be in the public domain. And you know what? All of these young people, and they are primarily young analysts who work at GCHQ. Consider this, when you're analyzing the information that is being put out there, and we're just focusing on the fracking agenda, but the information that we're putting out there, consider the possibility that you might actually be affected by this. Your children and potentially your grandchildren might be affected by this. Look at those who are trying to protect the future of this country's ecology. There is no political agenda here other than to shut down this abomination. David Cameron and the industry have been using the Crimea, the Ukraine Crimea crisis to start ramping up the fear that Russia might shut off gas supplies to the UK. Look, please, Go and check this out for yourselves. Look at DEC's own website. This country does not import any gas from Russia. Most of the gas comes from Norway, from our own supplies, or from Qatar. Some from the Netherlands and some from Belgium. But later this year, Centrica have said that they may start importing some gas from Russia that's based on a, uh, an agreement that was made with Gazprom some three, two to three years ago. So how very convenient that Centrica now start talking about uh, the need to import gas from Russia just as this crisis raises its head. As Raymond Emanuel said, never let a good crisis go to waste. So we're certainly up behind the eight ball and um, as I've said before, you know, to do what I do, I am totally reliant on donations and contributions. And it is still the case that I actually receive more donations from Australia than I do from the UK. And this is primarily because the people in Australia who have connections with this country and who have experienced the effects of this industry do not want to see the same thing happen here, particularly under a country that is so densely populated. So please, if you feel you can support the fracking awareness campaign, please go to frackingnightmare.com and consider making either a small monthly donation or a one-off uh, contribution to the fracking awareness campaign on the left-hand side of the page. We're up against a very powerful foe but what they don't reckon on is our commitment and our conviction to ensure that this industry does not get its bits in the ground in this country. So please come join us down at uh, Barton Moss or at the other sites at Farndon or in uh, Danes, uh, Danes Hill in Nottinghamshire and other sites that we'll be kicking off shortly. Come down, meet the protection community. And what you'll find is a wonderful group of people who have done the research and have dedicated themselves to this issue. And what you'll find is that they actually may not agree on very much else because they literally are truly representative of the full spectrum of society, but they do all agree on one thing, and that is that hydraulic fracturing has no place in this country. So, Bear, are you, uh, are you with us today? I am. Hello, Ian. Hey, how are you doing? Now, had you seen well. that um, GCHQ presentation before? I hadn't, no, but to be fair, it doesn't surprise me at all. Like you, I've been on the receiving end, though uh, not of a, a media smear, but I've actually been under surveillance, and I was actually fully aware I was under surveillance because the joy of the, uh, the uh, Metropolitan Police Force actually messed up surveilling me, so I actually was aware of what they were doing. <laughs> 
Well, you know, it's going to come in many ways, shapes, and forms. Um, I mean, I've seen my uh, computers wiped a couple of times remotely. Uh, needless to say, I don't keep anything uh, on on computers uh, on the hard drives now. It's yeah. on um, you know, multiple hard drives that are kept in uh, numerous different locations. <laughs> you know, we just have to be smart. But um, you know, we have no reason. Uh, not to be transparent and um, you know we have nothing to hide uh, so consequently let's put it out there and um, you know hopefully there are some intelligent people working in GCHQ who will realize that actually they're working for a criminal organization I mean just like you know people in Greater Manchester Police in fact not just the Greater Manchester Police but many other police forces uh, I noticed that the uh, Metropolitan Police is uh, on the front pages the last few days for destroying evidence. And, and more and more people around the country are realizing that uh, you know, our police forces really need a serious shakeup. But of course, this also may be part of the agenda because uh, actually, as the police forces destroy their own credibility, it gives the government the opportunity to say, oh, I got a great idea. Let's privatize it. Let's uh, put them out to G4S. And then God help uh, us. I know that's that's a very disturbing trend. I think I've mentioned before. Um, I worked in the security industry for ten years, and um, several of my friends are still in, and they run very large, several large companies, and they're getting quite worried because the amount of in, the amount of paperwork that's suddenly being put forward for them as a security firm is more or less exactly the same sort of standards that the police actually already have to perform to. So in one way, it's going to hit the industry hard and it's as usual, major corporations are going to take over and the small businessman is going to suffer. But it's a perfect example of the they're, prep, they're prepping the manpower resource, the, the pool of staff they're going to pull on when eventually the police force is shunted to a side and it is privatised. You know, these, these systems are already being put into play and have been for a few years. It is, it's, a pretty, it's a plan that they've been hatching for quite a while, I think. No, absolutely. And it's the same, of course, it's the same with the military. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we're probably going to see in the, in the coming weeks is as the likes of... Um, John Kerry and uh, William Haig, and uh, as I think I probably mentioned uh, before, uh, William Haig, of course, uh, has uh, hanging over his head some very unfortunate photographs that were purchased by um, The Sun. Now, actually, they were purchased by the News of the World. They were purchased by the News of the World before its uh, demise. Uh, but 20, I believe it was £25,000 that was paid for these photographs. This was actually part of the evidence uh, submitted to the Leveson inquiry and uh, although it was never actually revealed what these photographs uh, actually contain there is a lot of speculation that they uh, captured uh, William Haig um, in a rather uh, unfortunate location uh, <laughs> with somebody who he probably shouldn't have been with at uh, two o'clock in the morning and, and of course um, ever since uh, these photographs were acquired, uh, William Haig has been sort of banging the drum to try to get this country into another war. Yeah, I mean, if that happens, then, you know, as far as I'm concerned, William Haig needs to be standing right up alongside Tony Blair uh, in a war crimes uh, tribunal at some future date. Uh, to be uh, to my uh, my opinion, Ian, I agree with you, but I'd also personally would prefer them to be on the front line of the first assault if they do lead us into war. I think that uh, a lot fewer politicians, a lot fewer world leaders, would be so keen to send their population into these horrific conflicts if they ultimately had to lead the troops that they were deploying. I, I personally think that that's the only way, really, to ensure that most of these people wouldn't go into wars for fear of their own safety, because that's all they really care about is their own interests. I mean, the these psychopaths I mean they they have no courage I mean they are total cowards of course they're cowards I mean you, you know you would never ever see these guys anywhere near the front line and of course all of their children would be in protected professions I mean this is uh, you know pretty much a given isn't it well I mean the same thing happened in um New York, I think it was in the 1800s when they were drafting during the uh, Civil War. Oh no, that would be in the 1700s, wouldn't it? Sorry. Um, but they were, drafting, they were drafting troops and the only way that you could get out of it was to pay 
to be able to not, for your children not to fight. And that resulted in a massive riot um, and, and the army having to be deployed in New York to deal with the population there because they were so sick of being dragged to fight. And that's that's the thing, you know, there's always a loophole for the, for the elites be it being able to pay out or just being right, part of the right club to be able to not have to send your your sons and daughters to war. And um, you know, many people actually may not be aware that uh, that was a big part of how Ireland uh, regained its independence in uh, 1922. And it was based on the decision in 1916 by Lloyd George uh, that instead of just demanding that the Irish peasantry put their sons up for uh, cannon fodder in the Somme and other such um, wonderful places, that uh, uh, they actually wanted the middle classes to uh, put forward their offspring. And that was the point at which uh, basically the Irish population re rebelled, started to, re to rebel against the, uh, the British establishment, which ultimately led to, um, uh, to independence. And of course, this is you know, a classic example of the observation that it is only when the middle classes actually realise that they are going to be screwed uh, every which way that uh, social change actually comes about. You know, the, the working classes are always the first to feel it. But unfortunately, for whatever reason, they never actually manage to get their act together to drive that change. It's only when the middle classes get involved uh, with the working classes, obviously, in, uh, in support of them, that uh, that change comes about. And uh, I think that, you know, what's happening in this country, of course, is Osborne is desperate to try to keep the middle classes from realising the magnitude uh, to, of the pain and the, the grief that the working classes in this country are experiencing as they struggle to find work. And when they do find work, it's zero hours contracts, etc. So, you know, something has to give at some point here. Oh, no, I totally agree. And um, I don't know if you've read, but recently NASA um, uh, published a study looking into um, the natural rise and fall of civilizations. And basically they put forward the potential that our society is in a terminal decline phase. They didn't say that it is, but they said that it exhibits a lot of qualities. And that most societies, they tend to, they've realized through history, and this is from everything from like the ancient Romans, the Mayans, the Han, uh, Han dynasty in China, that the elites because the working class and the lower classes, they absorb so much of the damage and the hardship of financial and economic collapse that it allows the elite to buffer themselves for longer. So it's very much what Nero fiddling while Rome burns sort of syndrome is that basically that they, as far as the elites are concerned, because they're not feeling the pinch, because none of the suffering is coming into them, that's the reason that societies can collapse that seem very stable is because that the elites are literally there pieing away while all around them the palisades are burning and societies collapsing and in some ways it feels like that in many ways is the, the Tories as you say they're desperately trying to not allow the suffering and the pinch to be felt by those who could if they do rise up that they could have a direct effect and I also think another thing with you saying about the middle classes I think a lot of it is education as well is the fact I feel very lucky that I, I come from a working class family a hill farm but I had access to very good education resources and that's one of the reasons I'm able to help with the anti-fracking campaign but a lot of people I know grew up in the same way they just don't have the education all the time because they're forced to work constantly to survive and that's one of the reasons I think they, the most effective way they keep people suppressed well and, and of course uh... Um, uh, Tony Blair realised that uh, the, the education that was being offered, uh, effectively financed by the state, was potentially building towards uh, a point where the people would realise they're, they're being totally screwed. And, and that's why, of course, he introduced um, uh, education fees at a college and university. And, of course, they've been systematically increased over the last, um, what is it, he introduced them in 97, so that's, um, what's, gosh, it's late, 15 years. And, um, and now we're looking at, or the students are looking at uh, leaving college with loans or debts up to, in the region of £50,000. And, of course, those debts are excluded from any bankruptcy. So those debts are literally with you for life. And of course, this is the perfect discourager from the, uh, the working classes actually uh, going into an education because these are numbers that they can't even actually begin to imagine. Um, and the middle classes, of course, what's happening is that these fees are being funded by, by the families. So, so yeah, 
we're, we are, I think, very close to um, to something very significant occurring. And you know, one of the unique things about the anti-fracking movement, of course, is that it is bringing people together from right across the social and the political and philosophical spectrum, and uh, you know, people are talking and sharing each other's views and uh, and are beginning to realise that uh, you know, actually, um, even if they've got um, personal means. There are colleagues alongside them in the community that literally are living on the proverbial shoestring, me included. Mm. Yeah, indeed, Ian. I mean, I, I, I'm the same. I mean, one, I, I'm very similar. Is that I devote a lot of energy and time to the anti-fracking movement, and my work has suffered because of it. But um, all people around me, I see, you know, I live in quite a low-income um, area, and I, when I, where I was at university, I was in a very low-income area. I was at University of Sunderland, and um, it was it was gobsmacking to see. I mean, from my side as well, I was one of I went to start university in '97. I was the last person the other year to be receiving a grant and to have their tuition fees paid so I watched the change in education as well because when I started it was very free it was open and there was a lot of different people there but it became almost exclusively middle class and the more wealthy as the years went on and you could see the change in education and you could see also the resentment from the local areas as well you know it, it's, it's a very very strange situation I think that we are really at a turning point in uh, British history if not global history because of these the situation we find ourselves in. No. I think you're, you're absolutely right. And, um, you know, out of every crisis comes an opportunity. And uh, you know, I, I think that uh, we, we do have a tremendous opportunity. I mean, I'm certainly seeing that, uh, you know, the anti-fracking community is, is having a cohesion that I don't think has uh, happened in any other movement. And, and this is, of course, primarily because such a large tract of the country is affected. I mean, 64% of the country is, uh, is you know, not, not a, a backyard. It is the country, ostensibly. And um, what, we're only literally, what, four days away from the end of uh, the deck uh, consultation period. And after that, basically, the country is up for grabs. And, um, you know, either we wake up to it and shut this down or, God forbid, but, uh, you know, we are literally condemning future generations to lives of absolute abject misery. So now, Bear, um, we're going to take um, a short break in a second. And then when we come back, uh, I believe that you're going to discuss uh, well construction and um, well failure rates with us tonight. Yeah, that's correct. Just a few bits of data um, taken once again from Pennsylvania because I really like the fact that it's more or less the same size as the British Isles, so it's a really handy uh, target. But yeah, some, just some really interesting information, telling information about um, the well casings and the, the, how the industry is purported to actually act safely or doesn't, and, should and, we say. And of course, to put in perspective, um, Pennsylvania, as you say, is about the size of the UK. But the uh, population of Pennsylvania, the total population of Pennsylvania is about 12 million people and the bulk of that 12 million lives in the two cities of uh, Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. The rest of the country is extremely rural. So the impact in uh, Philadelphia is, uh, is literally um, minuscule. I mean, it's enormous, but it's minuscule compared to what it would be in the UK. Anyway, we'll come back and uh, talk about that in a couple of minutes. See you. If you take an active interest in maintaining the optimum health and well-being of yourself and your family, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is the magazine you've been waiting for. Having taken Australia and New Zealand by storm, the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine is now available in the UK and Europe. Visit www.nznaturalmed.co.uk or call 01626 337-531 to order your copy now. And welcome back to part three of Fracking Nightmare. So I'm with Bear and uh, Bear is going to discuss with us tonight the issues of well construction and more importantly well failure rates so bear what information have you got for us tonight 
Right, well, I've, um, I've taken most of my data from a study that was done by a gentleman called Professor Anthony Ingraffia. Now, I really recommend anybody who is interested in getting some hard data to be able to rebut anybody who's a pro-fracking actor, you know, in the pro-fracking sort of lobby. Um, Professor Ingraffia, he is um, very respected in the uh, petroleum industry, and he's taken as an, uh, a world-leading expert on well casings, well bore, and the, on rock mechanics, so the, the technology and the actual ground conditions involved in this. Um, and as I say, I'll repeat his name again. It's Professor Anthony Ingraffia. Really recommend anybody reading his stuff because it's really good information. Now, I took this from a study that he did in, I think it was 2010, and it's called Wellbore Integrity, Failure Mechanisms, Historical Record and Rate Analysis. Now, most of this data was, uh, was, um, was taken from uh, the, the official um, records from the Pennsylvania Department of Envir Environmental Protection. And he was able to get most of this through a consent order um, because of wa uh, the water supplies of 13 families that are impacted. Now, I've actually dealt with these 13 families before, talking about studies that were done in areas like Dim Dimmock, Pennsylvania. It's interesting that this does seem to be quite a focus point um, for water contamination, well bores, and information about this Pennsylvania area. And it's also very interesting that this is the area that the Environmental Protection Agency uh, mothballed the water ground study that was being done there. Yeah. As well, as well as completely ignoring their local offices staff who were saying the further study need to be done. So it is very interesting to see you can find these points where it, there has been obvious problem and a public outcry. And as usual, the official line is just to bury it. So I'll give you a few. Here's a few bits of data. This, this is really interesting. I think this is really telling in itself. Um, now, in 2010, as, as we've said, the Pennsylvania is a similar uh, sized um, area to the, U the UK. So if you look at this, 2010, there were 1,609 wells drilled. Now, comparatively to what um, the um, uh, chairman of IGAS said on Channel 4 recently, we're expected there to be 10 or 20 a year in the UK. Yeah, right. I think, um, it gives you a bit of an idea of the difference in scale of the operation. But um, of those 1,609 wells drilled, there were 64 violations and 47 additional wells with a loss of integrity. So that's 6% in total of all wells drilled. So that's 6%, 6% that are potentially causing threats to groundwater and leaks of pollutants. Now in 2011, that's one, there were 1,972 wells drilled, 97 violations, with 45 with a loss of well integrity. So that takes it to 7%. And then in 2012, less wells, 1,346, with 44 violations, but with 76 additional loss of integrity. So that's 9%. So we're well, seeing an exponential increase now um, of, of well failure. Now, something the professor in Graffia has said, he's got a few videos on the internet, he says that given time, all well casings will fail. And this is something that really has to be said. This isn't just because of different standards of practice. This is just simply the way it is is that eventually, no matter how much assurances these companies can give, the fact is that they might monitor it for 10 years, they might monitor it for 20 years until the company disappears, goes bust or changes. But after that point, eventually those casings are going to fail. And there is no, and there's nothing that can realistically be done to stop that with our current level of technology. And that's, I think, the most interesting part of what Professor Ingraffia is saying here is that, yes, the industry can put all, can put all the monitoring he wants to put into, into place, can put all the safety measures, but at the end of the day, realistically, there is nothing they can do to stop this happening because, especially with the scale that they're thinking of doing in the UK, that realistically, eventually, this is going to become a problem. And these, the, I mean, as well, that these have been seen directly wherever there's been an increase in um, thermogenic methane or heavy metals in well bores. Uh, in sorry, in uh, people's personal water supplies, there is found to be a corresponding. Um, breakdown in a well bore somewhere within that area if those areas aren't still active in fracking. So, it, in general, does Anthony and Graffia say that it's the casing or is it the cement around the casing that fails? So it's a case of both, really. Um, it depends. I mean, in most casings, if it's the metal casings that have gone down, it's usually substandard casings mm. that have been used. Um, but in most cases, it is the cement. As you, as, as you know, Ian, from working in the industry, being a cement engineer or a mud engineer is a very important job and involves vast amount of knowledge of knowing the appropriate cements to use in the appropriate geology and, and, and uh, uh, the appropriate stra uh, strata under the ground. It's different materials for different places. And a lot of cases, 
is it's because of cost cutting, inappropriate well casings have been used, or because of inappropriate prior geological study. So that it's a case of, I mean, and this is something that's come out from a lot of the uh, fracking operations in the UK. It's, all obvi it's obvious that they haven't done the geophysical studies yet. They haven't got the downhole knowledge. And this has led in America to cases where they've used inappropriate materials and has resulted in leakages. Well, and uh, I mean, well, this is what uh, gives me you know, real concern, uh, particularly with a company like iGas. But um, I mean, it's probably the same with uh, Dart Energy and Celtic, because these are all companies that really don't have a lot of experience. <laughs> and actually, because they don't have the experience, they don't actually employ the best or the brightest or the most experienced people. Uh, because they're working for the likes of Schlumberger, Halliburton, uh, Baker Hughes, etc. And uh, yeah, so when I uh, spoke with the um, well construction manager of um, um, iGas, a guy called by the name of Chris Bone, and I asked him how many wells he had uh, effectively designed and constructed that had been subjected to the stresses of high volume, high pressure hydraulic fracturing, and um, his answer was um, uh, none. <laughs> uh, so, you know, basically, I, I mean, obviously, uh, he's learning as he goes along. And, and by the way, this is the same guy who, when I asked him how many wells had been drilled in the UK and had been subjected to high volume, high pressure hydraulic fracturing, and his first guess was uh, 200, <laughs> when, of course, the correct answer is one. It is, yeah. and then it wasn't even horizontal. It was only no. It was a vertical section. section. Yeah. It was just a vertical section, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah, this is what we're up against. And the reality is that, I mean, first of all, as you and I both know, you cannot regulate uh, geology. Um, but it doesn't matter what the regulations are. If you've got somebody who has zero experience in this industry then uh, it, it is a recipe for disaster. And as you rightly say, I mean, you know, it isn't, it isn't ready mix that you go and buy from B&Q, or maybe Chris Bone thinks it is, I don't know. But it's not ready mix that you get from B&Q and then you sort of just pump it down the, uh, down the well. I mean, th th there is, there is a, not just a science, an art. I mean, as you know, um, you know, there are cement engineers who pride themselves on their capacity to sniff the quality of the cement, just like mud engineers can sniff the quality of the muds. And taste it in some and cases. Taste it, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, and they, they know, you know it's going to work or it's not going to work. Um, but, I mean, obviously, when people are going into hostile environments, and like, like shale, um, for the first time, you know, there's, there's a lot of unknowns. And especially when you've got a, a cement, a, a well construction manager who is literally green. Oh, totally. And I mean, there's more data from the Pennsylvania. I mean, this is even with companies that have experience in this area. I mean, in graph it says it should be noted that even with ongoing technological and chemical improvements in cement and cementing techniques, loss of well bore integrity is still common. For example, during 2011, Cabot, a company with a lot of experience, drilled 68 new Marcellus wells in Pennsylvania and was cited seven times for failure to report defective, insufficient or improperly cemented casings within 24 hours or submit plans to correct within 30 days. And Chesapeake Appalachia in the same um, time period, out of 279 wells, was cited 24 times. So this, even with the people with the experience, they don't seem to be able to do this properly anyway. No, no. And, and I mean, you know, we know that there, there isn't a, a mathematical model. It, no, is, no. it is best guess. I mean, obviously, the greater the experience of the... Um, uh, of the driller, of the mud engineer, of the uh, the uh, cement, uh, well, the, the well construction designer, and uh, the cementer on the job, then sure, you know, you perhaps minimise the risk, but that risk is always there. And, and like you say, that uh, you know, over a period of thirty years, every well is going to fail. And I mean, it doesn't take into account, you know seismic activity and that's the other issue of course that uh, although you know we don't exactly live in an earthquake zone in the uh, traditional sense um, not like the ring of fire around the uh, pacific rim but uh, nonetheless you know this country experiences a phenomenal amount 
of seismic events. Oh, yeah, so I mean, we, 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 we may not have any major fault lines, as you say, we're not near a, a plate margin, so we're like the Ring of Fire or the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, but uh, the, the, I think the thousands of microquakes every year. Exactly, and many uh, of them actually centred on Ollerton in Nottinghamshire, yes. which is, of course, right at the heart of the old coal industry. And, and you know, and a, and a big target area for the uh, coal bed methane extraction, which we both discussed. And I think you, your best description was fracking's ugly sister. Oh, no, that, that, that's underground coal gasification. But um, yeah, I mean, coal, coal, coal bed methane is uh, certainly the evil twin. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's it wants. I mean, this is something as well. I think that's coming out from a, personally my own studies, but I hope that it's starting to come out into the greater public sphere. Is that it's becoming more and more obvious um, because of fracking that uh, people obviously they assume these companies they're professionals they know what they're doing, and also the uh, the you know the BGS the British Geological Society. It's becoming more and more evident that we just don't have any of this information that we need to be able to realistically do this because a lot of the times a lot of these micro quakes we really don't understand what's causing them you know it, 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 we are shooting in the blind we've only drilled maybe one tenth of the way through the earth's crust we have no idea what's beneath us beyond the limits of our small scratchings because that's even the deep, deepest mines in britain which go down 10 15 miles there's still scratches in the surface more or less no absolutely absolutely so um in pennsylvania we talked about the the failure rate have you got uh, any information on the health the negative health impacts of the... Uh... I have, yes. Um, as I say, um, the Environment Agency was studied, were commissioned to do a study, and it was because of these 13 families that had cried out about this in Dimmock, Pennsylvania. Um, and the thing was, this was after years of complaints as well. They'd been, they'd been complaining of not only gas, methane, which was pretty obvious in the waters, because obviously it could be ignited, but also strange taste. Now, this is the really disturbing thing I found, is this is, it turned out, these were actually heavy metals mm. in the waters. Now, at first, they, there is examples of these heavy metals being present in the aquifers anyway, but I think the, I want to have a look here, the, the levels were up to... 12 times the average baseline level with potentials, I think that they were five times above the Environment Protection Agency's own safe levels for the, these contaminants in drinking water. And these included things like arsenic, selenium, and strontium. The interesting thing as well is, though, that in America, because they use such a large raft of chemicals for fracking as well, compared to the supposedly the small amount they're going to use in this country, these are also present in, the, in these fracking fluids as well. So it's very hard to tell, but it's a potential that these fracking fluids could have directly contaminated into the aquifer as well, rather than it just being a case of them disturbing groundwater. But even if it isn't, if it is just the natural um, heavy metals in the aquifers, that means that they're having an effect somewhere deep underground and have disturbed the natural hydrostatic properties, which means that, that potentially this water is probably deeper water from the aquifer where the heavy metals have saturated and it's been forced upwards because of their activities further, further underground. Well, and uh, as you rightly say, I mean, yeah, we're learning all the time about the, um, you know, the water supply. And, and in fact, I believe last year, uh, the Mexican government actually lobbied the American government and, and certainly the Texas state uh, legislature to um, actually stop drilling and fracking so deep because Mexico and Texas are both aware of some very, very deep underground freshwater aquifers. And the Mexican government has always effectively worked on the basis that this is the water resources for future generations. And uh, now they are very concerned that the cowboy um, unconventional gas industry from Texas is uh, showing absolutely no concern whatsoever and uh, is contaminating these uh, deep aquifers. It uh, doesn't surprise me, and to be fair as well, one of the problems with hydraulic fracturing is you actually don't know where it's going, so it is quite potential that they could frack Mexico from Texas if they so desired, which, to be fair, that has, I mean, that is, uh, has got some historical precedence as well because of um, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait and his destruction of the oil fields there. A lot of people talk about that, you know, he was, it was a two fingers to the West. But there was also the case as well that those Kuwaiti oil wells were extracting oil from Iraq oil fields they were hor they weren't just horizontal uh, vertical fracks they were doing some um, well they were they were actually uh, drilling into the neutral zone 
Um, oh, really? Which was, was yeah, but, but it was the, the agreement was that um, the neutral zone was neutral and no one should drill into it, and uh, there's no question that the uh, KOC, Kuwaiti Oil Company, was wittingly or unwittingly um, drilling into the neutral zone. Um, but I, I will have to um, uh, differ with you on Saddam actually destroying the oil field, as I am on record as saying on many occasions, and based on my own visits to Kuwait in um, late March of 91, the oil fields of Kuwait were not set alight by uh, Saddam Hussein. But um, that, that's uh, for uh, I'll another bow time. On you. I'll bow as the fact that you've been there happily and, and you have a lot more industry experience than me. I'll take your word on that one. Well, you know, there was uh, a much deeper geopolitical agenda uh, unfolding. And of course, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, not only was the American oil industry uh, working on behalf of KOC, uh, drilling into neutral zone, but of course, when Saddam actually challenged um, the US ambassador to Iraq, April Glasby, about this, Mm. Uh, she basically said, you know, if you want to sort it out, go sort it out. You know, we're not going to get involved in, I quote, Arab, Arab conflicts. And so, <laughs> so Saddam Hussein was basically baited into invading Kuwait. And the reason that uh, he was baited into invading Kuwait was because at the time he was seen as a loose cannon. And um, they wanted to keep Iraqi oil off of the global market uh, so that he didn't uh, deliberately tank the price. And, and of course, um, the setting the wells alight uh, was the perfect ruse for uh, demonising Saddam and, and effectively introducing the sanctions that kept Iraqi oil off the market right up until uh, after the invasion of 2003. Nothing is ever as it seems. And, um, you know, as, as you and I have discussed on numerous occasions, uh, you know, this agenda um, for hydraulic fracturing in the UK may have a much deeper, no pun intended, um, objective, which may be actually directly related to this nation's water supply. Well, with that um, quote that I found in that, uh, the uh, Environment Agency's document stating that in the future that they think the water will be used as a resource to be traded on the public market, I, it's starting to disturbingly look like that because, in essence, for me, I, I see water as an essential human right. There is no way that you could ever put a price on it. It is something that we need to live. It's essential to all life on Earth. And yet suddenly the Environment Agency that's meant to be there as the, the watch guard for this resource are talking about putting it on the public market as just another economic resource of the UK. That is a very disturbing but that, trend. But that also, Bear, that's another you know, um, construct. Mm. The Environment Agency is not there to protect the environment. Exactly. The Environment Agency is there to smooth the way with the public so that the corporations can basically do whatever it is they want to do. So, uh, you know, the Environment Agency is effectively a strategic um, front line mm. to, to find ways to gain social license. And, you know, what is interesting for me is, of course, the conference that was supposed to be uh, held in London, the Shale Gas Conference last week at the Jumeirah Marriott Hotel, um, based on the uh, frac carnival that was arranged um, to be held outside the venue, uh, the, the conference was moved to the uh, artillery building in, in, um, in, was it near Oldgate, Old Street? Fin Finsbury Square. Finsbury Square, there you go. And um, uh, basically, I looked at the presentations that have been posted on, uh, online, and you know what? The industry has actually stopped talking about social license. You know, I think they realise that actually they haven't got a cat's chance in hell of getting social licence. I mean, Andrew Austin says, you know, social licence has to be earned. I mean, at what point, at what point does he acknowledge that there is no social licence for iGas to operate in, well, the Northwest or anywhere else for that matter? But, you know, today was day 120 of the uh, Barton Moss campaign. And, you know, despite Peel Holdings' efforts in conjunction with IGAS to evict the uh, community protection camp, the camp is still there. The case is being challenged, of course, in the um, Royal Courts of Appeal. <laughs> Appeal, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, and the number of people, local people, 
from Earlham, Callishead, Eccles, Chorlton, Tameside, uh, uh, which is the other side of Manchester. But you know, people are coming in from all parts of Greater Manchester now to support the protection community. There is no social license. So consequently, it looks as though you know, Cameron and um, the industry have effectively given up the charade of trying to get social license. And they're just saying, you know what? We're going to do it anyway. And screw you. Well, we know this, that the, the government and the industry have an agenda. And that agenda is not in the best interests of the population of this country. So uh, just a few seconds before we have to end the show, Bear. So what are your final words for tonight? Uh, thank you once again for having me on the show. And to everybody out there, keep fighting the good fight. Keep talking to each other. Get educated. Get forearmed, forewarned. And let's fight this because we will win. We will indeed. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next week for episode 22 of Fracking Nightmare. Thank you and good night.